I particularly want to address some verses in relation to what Paul says about being a blasphemer. And uh, this study originally kind of came about as a result of some questions that were asked of me, uh, not asked directly to me, but they were posed on Facebook on, in one of the dispensational groups. And uh, the, the, the one question was, when Paul said, it, 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 well, the first question was, is blasphemy, in other words, in the book of Acts, when people rejected the message that the twelve preached, that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, was that really blasphemy? And the question was asked on the basis of what Matthew 12 says about blasphemy. Well, I used several scriptures in looking at that, and I've got one more I want to add tonight. Uh, the other thing was, Paul says, well, let's just read it, and, and I'll count on this when we get down there. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. So the question was asked, well, if that was a reason, in other words, if Paul was forgiven because he did it in ignorance, wouldn't that also apply to everybody else that did it in ignorance? And the, the, question be, uh, the answer to the question would be yes, uh, but the point is, is that the majority of those that rejected the message never, they never accepted the message. In other words, after that, the only way they could be saved was by the mercy of God. And so the, the fact that he did it ignorantly is not the reason he was saved. The reason he was saved is because of God's mercy. And he says there in verse 15, or verse 14, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So I'm going to put on the board up here. Uh, we'll just put the cross right here at the middle. And back here uh, in the Old Testament, God Almighty uh, spoke to the people, to the, to the nation through the prophets. Uh, if you go go back to Acts chapter seven, Acts chapter seven, look in verse fifty one. This is a message of Stephen. And uh, he's talking to if the nation Israel. And he says in verse 51, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. Well, now that part will partially answer one of the questions right there. What were they resisting? They're resisting the Holy Ghost. He didn't say, you're resisting us, even though it did, they did resist them. But he says, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? So the prophets back here in the Old Testament were persecuted and they rejected the message of God the Father in rejecting those that God sent. Remember what Jesus Christ said? He said, uh, if you reject whom I send, you sit, you're rejecting me. So the Lord Jesus Christ and his first coming comes over here. And the Bible says he came unto his own, and his own received him not. And so back here, they rejected God the Father. Over here, they rejected God the Son. In the beginning was the Word, words with God, and the Word was God. So they rejected God the Son. They said, we'll not have him to rule over us. And he ends up going there to the cross. Now, in in Acts chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, we have the disciples carrying out the ministry that God gave them. But when they spake, go back to Acts chapter 2 while we're here in Acts. There's 
there's a, a key phrase there in, in Acts 2, 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak. And uh, he says, with other tongues, the Spirit gave them utterance. Well, notice back in chapter 1, in, in John chapter 1, verse 4, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Well, then there was a purpose and that purpose Jesus Christ outlined in the book of John when he said, when the comforter has come, he'll guide you into all truth. And so they were preaching the Old Testament scriptures as it related to God the Father. They were proclaiming the message of God the Son, the twelve were, having been instructed of him three years and then forty days and forty nights. And yet they were given the Holy Spirit and he says that you're to tarry there, not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you've heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So they were baptized with the Holy Ghost. When Stephen is speaking, he says, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. And so uh, I'm not going back through all the scriptures we looked at last week, but if you go back to Matthew 12, there's a key verse there. That I believe really shows us that to reject the ministry of the twelve was to blaspheme the Holy Ghost. And here it is. It's in, in Matthew chapter 12. Look in verse 30. He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth with me scattereth abroad. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. In other words, they blaspheme God. You can read about that in the Old Testament. Several mentions where the name of God was blasphemed. They blasphemed the Son. They spoke against Him. And the rejection of the ministry over here of the twelve was a rejection of the Holy Spirit. Now, the, the question that, that bothers people is that it doesn't say that exactly, but notice what it does say. Verse 31, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men, and whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now, if you look at this thing dispensationally, it really makes sense. Because God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, when Jesus Christ spoke these words, there was no mention of the mystery. There was no knowledge of the mystery. Uh... And so all that they knew was that they were going to make an offer of the kingdom once again over here and they didn't know that God was going to interrupt that program and bring in an apostle that was going to write 13 epistles and get saved by grace through faith. And so what we have is this information here after this interruption, this information helps explain what was going to take place back here, but didn't, and preparing people for it. In other words, they expected the seventh that week of Daniel to begin there in the book of Acts. That was the next 70 weeks are determined upon thy people Israel. 69 of them been fulfilled. One was not. That's a week of years, seven years. And so Hebrews through Revelation prepares people for that period of time. Romans through Philemon doesn't prepare people to go through the tribulation. It tells us that we've been delivered from the wrath to come. So, the reason, in other words, why would Christ say that you can't be forgiven this over here? Because that was the last chance, you see. As far as Israel was concerned, that was their last chance. They had rejected God the Father, they rejected God the Son. One last chance. And what did Peter say? Repent. 
And look back in Acts chapter 2. Well, I tell you, before we leave here, uh, verse 32, Whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, that is the time period in which they were living, nor neither the world to come. And so they died apart from God. They end up in the lake of fire. Now, you go over to... He, uh, Look in Hebrews. I believe that's where I want to go. Hebrews chapter 1. Now Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. Hebrews 1, verse 1. God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son whom he hath appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds so he, and then he says who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high in other words Jesus Christ in those last days spoken to Israel he went to the cross. God raised him up, highly exalted him, gave him a, a name which is above every name so that when you go back to Acts chapter 2, I know there's a lot of flipping, but need to look at the verses. When you get over to Acts chapter 2, there's some, uh, I mean, the, the chapter is just... At, it's a shame what religion has done to Acts chapter 2 and 3. Because everybody takes this and tries to cram it into the doctrine for the church and body of Christ and make this the beginning of the church. Uh, I told somebody, uh, I was doing a study a couple weeks ago on 2 Corinthians, and I mentioned on Sunday night to the folks that if the religious world understood Romans chapter 15, and I can't even remember the verse right now, the verse where it says, Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision confirming the promises made unto the fathers. If they understood that in Acts chapter 2, it would clear up 99% of the confusion in religion today. Because in Acts chapter 2, Peter, verse 14, standing up with 11, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. Well, had a Church of Christ preacher call me one time and confront me about an ad we had run in one of these little shopper papers. And I knew exactly where he was going to go to Acts 2.38. And I asked him, I said, would you look at some verses with me in Acts chapter 2? I said, read verse 14. And he read it. I said, who is he speaking to? He said, us. I said, what tribe are you a part of? He said, well, we took their place. I said, show me in the scripture where it ever said we took their place. He said, well, the Holy Spirit has to show you those things out of the scripture. I couldn't show it to you. <laughs> yeah, right. Now, notice what he says. Verse 15, for these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days. And he begins to quote from Joel there. Then look in verse 22. So we know what Peter's, the frame of his reference here is that what is taking place here is the beginning of this 70th week. Because that's what this refers to. The sun shall be turned into darkness, moon into blood. All the blood moons that's been taking place in the last few years have nothing to do with Acts 2, verse 19. By the way, the Lord was supposed to, have, the end of the world was supposed to have come, I believe it was yesterday, wasn't it? September 23rd, what's the date, the 24th? Yeah, 23rd was, I saw on Facebook last night, somebody posted, said, well, the, it's almost midnight and the 23rd's come and gone and the Lord didn't come back, so. Huh? The Pope is here. That's why they got it mistaken. The Lord, the the Pope showed up on the twenty third, not the Lord. That's a good one, Dave. I have to remember that. 
So, but see, people thought the Lord was here. I mean, the way they treated that man. Don't get me started on that rant. Oof. So, notice in verse 22, ye men of Israel, hear these words. Uh, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. Uh, go over to, to verse uh, 36. Notice again. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly. You see, this was Israel's last opportunity. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of of the Holy Ghost. When they rejected that message, they blasphemed, in effect, the Holy Ghost. You do always resist the Holy Ghost, he says. Now, why was that important as far as Israel was concerned? Because it was their last opportunity. And so, when you get over here and you see that 70th week being proclaimed there by Peter, the idea would be that for seven years they'd go through that tribulation time preaching this gospel of the kingdom, trying to get Israel saved, and the Lord would return, make the new covenant with the house of Israel, and establish his covenant with those saved Israelites, and fulfill what he said to the little flock. He said, you little flock, I'll take the kingdom from the nation and give it unto you. And all of that could have been fulfilled prior to the salvation of the Apostle Paul if God didn't have another plan. But he did have another plan and that was to save the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul makes an interesting statement. Look over in Acts chapter 26. Acts 26. By the way, if when Paul had stood there and heard Stephen preach, if he had repented, he would have done exactly what Peter and the twelve had instructed him to. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. But he didn't do that. He rejected it. And so he says in Acts chapter 26, uh, notice there in, in verse 6, and now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come, for which hope, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God would raise the dead? I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them, and punished them off in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme and be exceedingly mad against them. I persecuted them even unto strange cities. So what was Paul trying to compel them to do? To reject the ministry of the twelve? Do not believe the, the gospel that they were being preached. And what does he say he, called, he was trying to compel them to do? To blaspheme. So it's one and the same. I don't think you can separate it. And to, to look at those verses, then we know that they did blaspheme. And Paul said he was a blasphemer, but he said, I did it ignorantly in unbelief. But what's interesting about that, when Paul heard, or when he saw the Lord on the road to Damascus, it wasn't some man telling him to repent and be baptized for remission of sins. 
Now, Paul went down and got baptized. I don't think there's a doubt about that. But it was not for the remission of sins because Paul acknowledges there in 1 Timothy where he read that it was by God's grace and His mercy that he was saved. And he said that in me first. So don't let somebody throw you off just because Paul said he did it through ignorance. Because in the book of Numbers, chapter 15, we won't take time to go back there. I looked at those last week. Leviticus 4, Numbers 15 there are at least seven or eight verses in both those chapters that said if you sin through ignorance, then this is what you do. You bring the sacrifice. If the priest sin through ignorance, God provided for that. Peter said in Acts chapter 3, uh, you did through ignorance. Look in Acts 3 while we're here in this chapter. And Acts 3, verse uh, 14, he says, But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired her murder to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot it through ignorance. You did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before has showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he so fulfilled. In other words, the time of this ignorance, you know, God, this ignorance, they did it, they put him to death through ignorance. But now what are they having? Another opportunity. Paul was doing it through ignorance. What did he have? Another opportunity. But with Paul, it was not the salvation that Peter preached. It was salvation that had never been preached before. Now, there's an illustration of this that I, and I closed last week by mentioning this and I said I wanted to look at it because it really, to me, demonstrates the position that Israel found themselves in after rejecting the Holy Ghost and after having committed blasphemy. Uh, in Acts chapter, go over to Acts chapter 20. In Acts chapter 20, uh, in verse 18, And when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice what he says. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that, bond, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count, I my, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, and the ministry which I received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. So anybody that says Paul was out of God's will by going down to Jerusalem, you can just I mean, ignore that. Paul said he is fulfilling the ministry to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And he said, And now behold, I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Paul expected to die there in Jerusalem, I believe. And he said, remember what he wrote in Romans 9, 10, and 11 about his desire and prayer for God was to, for, to Israel so they might be saved? Uh, that he had great heaviness and a continual sorrow for his own people? Well, notice over in Acts chapter 21. In Acts chapter 21, verse 15. And after those days we took up our carriages and went up to Jerusalem. There went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea and brought with them one mason of Cyprus, an old disciple, with whom we should lodge. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly and the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. 
And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things. I don't imagine that was, you know, like this. It was a verbal salute, I would imagine. When he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his mouth. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they're all zealous of the law. Now there's a lot of people today, great, call themselves grace preachers, that would tell you that those people in verse 20 were lost because they were zealous of the law. And yet the Bible says there are thousands of Jews there which believe. They're believers. Hold on here and look back in Acts 15. And this is important because there's categories of Jews that we're going to see that if people would get straight in their mind, it would make a lot more sense. In Acts 15, verse 1, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phineas and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. Look in verse uh, 5. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Well, what did they believe? They believed exactly what Peter and James and John said they were to believe. They believed in the name of Jesus. They believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. As in Acts chapter 8, when Philip preaches to the eunuch there, what does he say? He said, here's water, what does hinder me to be baptized? And Peter said, if you believe that Jesus, he said, if thou believest, you might be baptized. You can be baptized. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And they went down in the water and baptized him. That's what they believe, folks. So you get over here, and Paul is down at Jerusalem. And there's a group of Jews there that believe. And they keep their zealous of the law. They believe and they keep the law. Now notice Paul's response to this. Verse 21. And they, the thousand Jews that believe and are zealous of the law, they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. Now, Paul doesn't respond to that, but think about this. If Paul has gone into a synagogue and preached the gospel of Christ and told them that Christ died for their sins, which if they believed that he was the Son of God, he would have told them that, like at Galatia, and then he leaves and somebody else comes along and says, well, you must be circumcised. Well, you, you see with the conflict there? So Paul doesn't respond to that. Why? Because he's got a ministry to fulfill. Now notice what he does. What is it therefore the multitude must needs come together for they will hear that thou art come? Do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. Them take and purify thyself with them and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing but that thou, the, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols, and from blood, and from strangled, and from fornication. Then Paul took them in, and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. 
Now, these passages have just baffled people for years because here Paul is, the one who wrote Galatians and said, if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. We're not under the law. We've been made free from the law. And yet he is consenting to do that which those that were zealous of the law encouraged him to do. Look in verse 27. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him. So then we have another set of Jews there, don't we? These Jews, it says right there, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple. Well, if they saw him in the temple, where would they have to be? In the temple. <laughs> so these are these are Jewish people that are still worshiping the temple. And when you get down to verse 27, when they when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place and further brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. For they had seen before with him the city of Trophimus and Ephesian whom they supposed that Paul had brought unto the temple. Don't ever let the facts get in way of a good story or a good charge. I mean, they're charging Paul with something based on something that didn't happen there, but they'd seen something previously, and so they're accusing Paul because they have nothing else to accuse him of. Verse 30, And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. And as they went about to kill him, <laughs> you think these people were upset? Well, think about this. I mean, Paul said, Neither count I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy. He said, When I go away, you're not going to see my face anymore. Why did Paul know that's what was going to happen? What did he do in Acts chapter 8? He was standing there holding the coats of those that stoned Stephen to death. So, he says, it says in verse 31, And as they went about to kill him, tidings came unto the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in an uproar, who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. Then the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded who he was and what he had done. Is there any way possible that this group right here that did this to Paul could have been the same group back here that was rejoicing in his ministry. No way. Could not have been. I mean, back here, these Jews, there's thousands of Jews that believe they're zealous of the law, and it says back there that they are in... It says, thou see, uh, I'm sorry. Uh... Verse 19, when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry, and when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. Well, it's a different group of Jews. These are blaspheming Jews that are in that temple. Why? You see, people want to present the idea that Paul went down there to try to teach those people that were keeping the law they shouldn't be keeping the law. Two separate groups. He wasn't trying to... Get, those people already were in the kingdom they were already part of the little flock. They were believers. They were zealous of the law. Paul is going down there. And why? Because these people had already rejected the message of the twelve. And the only way they could be saved was just like Paul was saved. That's why he makes a statement that it's his ministry to go down there and testify the gospel of the grace of God. Because that message of grace was the only message that could save them. That tells me that these were blaspheming Jews. These were believing Jews. Now people you know, get all in a dither about why Paul would go into the... take a vow and shave his head and do all those things that pertain to the law. Well, 
There's an answer to that. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And there's something that people really need to understand that rightly divide the word of truth. And that is that we are not called upon to do the same things that Paul did, particularly in his early ministry. Paul said, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. When we follow Paul, we follow Paul in the doctrine given through the apostle Paul. We don't follow Paul in his actions, particularly in the book of Acts, because after all, in the book of Acts, Paul healed. Paul cast out demons. Paul raised the dead. Paul spoke in tongues. I mean, people, you know, talk about they want to be baptized. They ought to be baptized because Paul was. Why don't they do all those other things, too, that Paul did? He tells us why he did it. Look into 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. Well, doesn't that one statement there completely explain everything we just read in Acts 21? He went down there. There was Jews. They said, to prove that you're not against them, they want you to take a vow. What does he say he did? Unto the Jews I became as a Jew. You see, you can't do that today because the Jew at this time is not are not God's people. And so he says, Unto the Jews I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jew. Next, notice the next statement. To them that are under the law. Now wait a minute. We got all these preachers saying that if you preach that the law was in effect after the cross, you're denying what Christ did on the cross. Well, Paul said there were some people under the law. And he said to them that are under the law, as under the law, Acts 21, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might say that I might by all means save some. And then notice the next verse. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. You see, Paul had a unique ministry, in that when he started his ministry, he made it clear that the gospel was the power of God of salvation to everyone that believed it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What advantage then hath the Jew, he said, much every way. And that was true in the early part of Paul's ministry. But when Paul became a prisoner of Jesus Christ for us Gentiles, he wrote some books when the Jew no longer had the advantage and that show us that we were Placed into the when we got saved, we were placed into the same body that those who first trusted Christ were placed into, and we're all one in Christ. And the fact is, is that that account, regardless of any other evidence we have, that account right there would show me that those people had blasphemed, and the only hope for them to be saved was through the Apostle Paul. After all. All those thousands of Jews are down there at Jerusalem. James is down there. They're zealous keeping the law. Why would Paul need to go down there and preach to a bunch of Jews? See, people say, well, he went down there to get them into the body of Christ. No. Paul never tried to get any Jew that had believed the, the message of Peter, James, and John into the body of Christ. They coexisted. They understood. And Peter understood. But he said it was some things that were hard to be understood pertaining to the fact that the Lord hadn't returned. And so Paul goes, the blasphemer, goes and preaches to the blasphemers with a message of grace. And he calls it the gospel of the grace of God. All right, anybody got a question or a comment for we? By the way, one other verse. Look in Colossians chapter 3. People just want to persist and believe with all their heart that blasphemy is still the unpardonable sin. Well, here's a verse for you right here that, that you can show somebody 
and there's no denying it. If you go back to Colossians chapter 1, verse 3, Paul says, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is coming to you, as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it does also in you since the day you heard it and knew the grace of God in truth. Are these people saved or lost? They're saved. Saved people. Look in Colossians 3. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. I think that's the one. Let me see. No. Uh, Back up to verse uh, verse 5. Colossians 3, 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil cupids, covetous, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, for in, in the which ye also walk sometime when ye lived in them. But notice what he says now. But now ye also put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Well then, if blasphemy is the unpardonable sin, how is it he told some saved people to put it off? You see, you can speak against the Holy Spirit, you can speak against God, but if you're saved, you're still sealed in the day of redemption. And so, somebody asked me not long ago, well, what about if a person got saved and then quit believing, would they still be saved? If they were ever saved, they would be. Their mind may get confused. They may say, do whatever. But if they actually trusted Christ. Now the case is, many times people don't really trust Christ. They just say they did. All right. What's that verse that says God cannot reject himself? God cannot deny himself? Yeah, God can't. Yeah, it's in uh, 1 Timothy. Or Second Timothy. Let's see. I just read that the other night. Huh? That's how we're thinking. Someone said that to me. Like, if I believe, then stop believing. I wouldn't be saved. But well, if you truly believe, God cannot. He can't deny himself. I can't find it now. Let's see. Nevertheless, yeah, Second Timothy two. Uh, verse 19 nevertheless the foundation of God stand is sure having this seal the Lord knoweth them that are his that's not it is it no, verse 12. I, got, I got down too far yeah. verse 13 if we believe not yet he abideth faithful he cannot deny himself so a person today that saved could, could speak against blaspheme whatever not going to change their salvation if they're sealed on the day of redemption. And yet people walk around in fear. Oh, you know, you've sinned away your day of grace. You blaspheme. Can't get saved. Oh, J. Harold Smith, when I was a teenager, preached a famous message, God's Three Deadlines. And it was three things that a person could do whereby they could never be saved. And Betty, when he preached those things, he could get people in the altar. I'm telling you what. You get to get to get them walking the walk in the aisle. The church I used to go to he had seven, he had seven deadly sins. Seven deadly sins. He had a series of messages like for months. Well, the the three points he made, the God's three deadline for blasphemy, sending away your day of grace, which was continual rejection. You reject so much that God quits dealing with you. And the third one had to do with living in sin after you get saved and God will kill you like he did in 2 Corinthians 5. Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. That was the third one. And that was a saved person, yeah. That's really that's really understanding the grace of God, isn't it? <laughs> All right, appreciate y'all being here tonight. We still on, Dave? You Good night, folks.